Awesome. So welcome everyone to another series of the ISI NLP seminar. Today we have Sitchin Gururangan as our speaker. Sitchin is a third year PhD student at the University of Washington. He's advised by Professor uh, Noah Smith and uh, Luke Zebelmoyer. He was previously a visiting research uh, researcher at Meta AI, a pre-doctoral AI resident at the Allen Institute for AI and spent several years as a data scientist in the industry. Um, he, his research spans a lot of um, areas within NLP. Um, I've enjoyed previously and in the past reading his work on Don't Stop Your Training. And ever since all the papers that he's put out has been very um, interesting. So I definitely recommend going through his Google Scholars list for uh, all, all these great papers. Um, he's won great awards at ACL 2020 and 2021 and he's supported by the Bloomberg Data Science PC Fellowship, as um, the same with Alex Smanger from our group as well, so that's cool. We are very excited about his talk today on modular language models, and I'm very excited to learn about how we can overcome the issues with dense training and democratize language model customization. So without further ado, let's welcome Sachin. Thanks, uh, thanks Justin, for the great intro. Um, yeah, everyone, I'm Sachin, and um, yeah, I'm a third year PhD candidate at the University of Washington, um, also a local here in LA. Um, and so I'm here to talk about my research on building modular language models, uh, which I've been pursuing over the past few years and really excited to share with you today. Um, before we begin, I just want to give a shout out to all of my amazing collaborators who helped me bring a lot of these research business to life. Um, many of these projects were done very close collaboration with these folks and wouldn't be possible without all their support. I specifically wanted to give a shout out um, Margaret Lee, who co uh, the two main projects I'll be talking with um, you guys today. But. All right, so the driving observation of uh, my research in general is that language data is heterogeneous, right? It's really amazing that we get to work with data that's so rich in variation. It's driven by social process and intent. It's driven by the background and history of the writer. It's, it's really reflective of the diversity of human experience, right? Um, and in the literature, there are countless studies in NLP, linguistics, and sociolinguistics that study the various groups and subsets of texts that make up language diversity. You know, there's uh, lots of axes by which language might vary, including time and community membership and applications. And my own research is really inspired by these studies and asks, you know, how do we make use of all this language variations, um, especially in massive data sets, to uh, build better language models? And so this involves qualitative and quantitative investigations into data sources and uh, new modeling innovations that make use of those findings. And uh, so just to ground our discussion, you guys are all aware of this, uh, but you know, here's the basic language model that we're working with today. Uh, we've modeled probability distribution over strings and we decompose it into the probability of each token condition on its history. Um, nowadays, we estimate this probability distribution using a neural network. Um, and the thing that has revolutionized NLP over the last few years is that these tools are not just useful for modeling distributions over strings. Uh, we can also perform lots of complex downstream NLP tasks with them, such as text classification and code generation and Lots of really cool stuff. Um, uh, basically, the past few years, we found that like data is a really key ingredient to building really good language models. And so, back in 2020, OpenAI released a scaling laws paper, which showed this phenomenon that really gripped the language modeling community uh, ever since. Um, you know, they show that the performance of language models is directly tied to the amount of compute and the data that you use, um, and they tend to follow these sort of power law distribution, where exponential increases in data leads to simulate linear improvements in um, language modeling performance. And uh, nowadays we've scaled the amount of data that we use to train these models to trillions of tokens. Um, so this is from the recent LAMA paper. And we're basically seeing consistently improving performance on downstream tasks. Um, and so as the uh, size of models have grown over the past years, so um, has the amount of data that we're using to train these models. And nowadays, language models are trained a wide variety of data sets, such as web scrape data, code, scientific papers. And together, obviously, these data sets reflect the heterogeneity of language. But even if you look at in these individual data sets, you'll see a lot of really interesting variation. Um, so let's look at a single one of these data sources, um, such as uh, web crawl. So here I've embedded a single shard of common crawl, um, about 400,000 documents, uh, with TF-IDF. And then I've clustered it and then visualized here with the UMAP. And uh, you can see there's lots of interesting domains that make up this random chart. You know, tech articles, health documents, books, social media content, many more. Okay. So um, the problem that I've been grappling with recently is that despite all this heterogeneity that we see in language, 
the standard recipes for training language models tend to treat all this data homogeneously. And by that, I mean, instead of explicitly conditioning on uh, the language variation, um, to train language models, we flatten out all the clusters, we treat each sample as IAD, and then we train in a fashion that I call dense training, where we update all the parameters of the model with respect to all of that data. Okay? This effectively makes these domains implicitly discoverable in the model instead of explicitly conditioned on. And it assumes that we're going to fit all these domains equally well. Okay. Um, this makes sense from a couple of perspectives, right? One, um, it's, you don't really need to care so much about your data and modeling is as hard as it is. And two, you know, if I want my model to be robust to uh, distribution shifts after training, the training this actually might be good because when you're shuffling all of your data, you're going to be introducing lots of complex distribution shifts during training. What, what I'm going to argue is that um, dense training leads to a number of really important, well-known issues with language models that really hinder their usefulness and safety um, at, after training. Um, so first, dense models tend to emphasize the largest domains in the corpus, okay? So the larger the domain, the better the fit. Um, since the dense model is learning a single general distribution over the corpus with standard maximum likelihood objectives, the model is gonna perform best on the larger domains and underperform rare ones. So we showed in a paper recently called Whose Language Counts as High Quality that data selection practices for large language models tend to favor text from the most viral uh, content on the internet. And so dense models are gonna re reproduce this bias. Second, uh, dense training is really expensive. So to update all of the parameters of the network, you need many GPUs active synchronously. And so this expense is gonna grow with the size of the network. And uh, so for example, like a Palm was trained with 6,000 TPUs for three months. Um, so this limits who can contribute to the systems in the first place. Um, and third, uh, we showed in a paper called Dense Free Training that adaptation is really important to do after dense training. But with any sort of fine tuning of dense models, uh, you're removing all their parameters into these subspaces, right? So you're gonna have this uh, phenomenon of catastrophic forgetting, which we talked about recently, um, meaning that if you pre-train on task A, and then you continue training on task B, you're gonna underperform on task A, right? So forget forgetting precludes a lot of model reuse and results in a lot of uh, wasteful compute. Um, and finally, dense models are really susceptible to unreliable behavior. Right? It's really common to have dense models generate toxic or otherwise unwanted behavior. And uh, you know, just see ChatGPT or Bing. Um, we showed this for uh, lots of models, um, including GPT-2 and 3, in a paper called Real Toxicity Prompts. Um, basically, since the dense model is learning <coughs> domains diffusely over its parameter space, it's impossible to remove unwanted domains after training. Right? So if the model is exposed to hate speech at some point during training, you're kind of stuck with that. So anyway, in dense, dense training is really convenient, it's very impressive, um, but it increases the risks of deploying models because it muddles the relationship between modeling and data, and it centralizes the language model development process um, by requiring a ton of synchronous compute, and it prevents cheap customization and reuse of the model for a variety of different downstream tasks. I think addressing these issues are really important if we want to build language systems that are safe and useful for everyone. So our proposal is to, to address these issues is to build modular language models. So instead of training a single model on all your data, we instead train specialized components um, or experts where each expert is specialized to distinct domains of your pre-training corpus, right? So we're bringing back this heterogeneity into the training. And then we do this ability to mix and add and remove these components as you want after training. And this framework is emphasizing this idea that uh, flexibility and customization at test time is really important to be able to address the issues that I mentioned before. So there's a clear relationship between model parameters and data provenance, which makes model behavior more predictable. And users have this ability to customize the language model with very cheap operations, interacting with only a few experts at a time. Okay. Um, and looking forward, you know, modular language models may lead to a future where instead of merely being consumers of large, dense models trained by large corporations, institutions or users could own the development and maintenance of experts. So the modularity of the system should enable uh, experts to be trained and contribute to asynchronously. Users can download the subsets of experts uh, trained on their, related to their use case, uh, or opt out as they want. Um, and finally, compute and data can be pooled across different members of the community towards experts that are part of this larger system. So I think this kind of framework represents a uh, real promise for a next set of language models that are more reliable and democratized. So in this talk, I'm gonna describe our steps towards building modular language models. Um, I'm gonna talk about how we uh, introduce modularity into the model, uh, which as I mentioned before, should enable users to rapidly customize the model after training. 
Um, and we're also going to uh, discuss our efforts to introduce asynchrony uh, into training um, so that we can train and update experts completely independently, which is really important for scaling into massive data sets. And I'm also going to highlight our focus on sparse inference, where uh, despite training many parameters and many experts, users only have to interact with a few experts at a time. All right, so the talk is divided into two parts, and the first part is centered around an algorithm we use to train modular language models called branch train merge. <laughs> and then I'm going to discuss our most recent work on cluster branch train merge, uh, which we use to scale these uh, sort, of, sort of technique into uh, much larger data sets. <laughs> Um, any quick questions before I? Yeah. I mean, you say experts, you're talking about the trained model, right? They are the experts. Exactly. Uh, well, yeah. Um, experts generally are just um, components of a model, right? Just generally. And um, we'll, I'll show you the, the ways that we concretize that. In, um, in yeah, the question is more because you said uh, people can locally use experts, but then you're not allowed to fine tune them on the locally, is it? Uh, you can fine tune them locally if they're small enough. Um, and there are lots of there are lots of interesting things coming out today that lets you fine tune larger models, but um, we can talk about that a little bit. Cool. All right, so um, let's look back at one of the main limitations of dense training. Right, so it's really expensive. Um, so as I mentioned before, the main culprit of this cost is uh, the need for synchronous compute. Um, since we have to communicate gradients and activations across all the GPUs at each step, and this cost is going to grow with the size of the model. Um, there are other, lots of other practical limitations of requiring synchronous compute to train models. Um, so training large language models is really complex. Um, so if a single node in your whole system fails, you have, that's going to down the entire system and you need to restart the entire checkpoint, which is really infeasible to do when you have thousands of GPUs active. Um, it's also difficult to allocate massive synchronous jobs on high performance GPU clusters. We did some analysis of allocation wait times uh, on the meta cluster and displayed that there's almost a linear increase in the average wait time as you allocate jobs with more nodes. Um, and finally, there's lots of communication that happens behind the scenes to make you know, synchronization work. So there's expensive Ethernet connections that you know, most people don't have access to. And otherwise, the training can be really slow as you increase the number of GPUs that you're training with. <laughs> so an alternative to dense training is conditional computation or a sparse training. I'm going to use those terms interchangeably for the truck. Um, and this is going to serve as the sort of basis um, of our, our solution to address these problems. Um, so in dense training, as I mentioned before, we use every parameter on every training example. So this is usually implemented through some form of like data parallelism or model parallelism. Um, on the other hand, sparse training or conditional compute um, uses a small subset of the model on each example. Okay, so this technique has primarily been used um, to scale the number of parameters that you train at a vastly reduced uh, inference or and training cost. Okay. Um, Generally, uh, it's sort of a brief history of conditional compute. You know, these ideas have been around for a really long time. Um, I think it was first proposed by Jeff Hinton and co in the early 90s, but I think the ideas are much older than that. Um, the framework gained some new steam from a 2017 paper from Google that used conditional compute to really efficiently scale a, a recurrent neural network language model. Uh, but nowadays, conditional compute has materialized as a mixture of experts models, where we specialize parts of the transformer to different data uh, usually at the token level, um, and then we merge the expert outputs for a particular sequence. And so there's lots of research on how to do this routing between tokens and experts. Um, the two most popular approaches being learned routing, uh, which you might be familiar with, with switch transformers or G-shard, where you're kind of learning a mapping between tokens and, um, and experts. And then there's uh, also deterministic routing, where there's some static, you, you just assume there's some static feature related to the data that's going to... Um, that you're going to use to route. Um, in the literature, inducing conditional computation in the transform language model is usually focused on the feed forward layers and making the feed forward layers sparse. Um, it's not only because the feed forward layers tend to be the workhorse of the transformer in terms of like featurizing the input. Um, when we scale language models, uh, the feed forward layers are actually the, the, the parts of the model that consume the most number of flops. Um, and so historically, and here I've shown a plot here of like the OPT language models as a function of the number of total parameters uh, and looking at the total um, 
percentage of flops that were consumed by the feed forward layers. You can see it basically grows substantially as the total model size increases. And so the initial PP was focused on whether we can make this feed forward layer sparse and uh, so we can increase the parameter count of the model uh, without the associated flops. The embedding is not considered there. And I know that it's exactly. going to be consistent, constant, but it's high. Exactly. There's going to be some point at which it exceeds. Do you know approximately when the feed forward starts to become not relevant? Uh, I, not feed forward. The, the attention layer. The, no, the embedding. Oh, the embedding layer. I actually don't know. Um, I had this, I had that in my sheet. I forgot where exactly it, it crosses over. Um, but I can look that up and, and let you know. <laughs> Typically, um, this is like fifty thousand. Yeah, it's something so like. And what's the embedding? The embedding should be. Um, I think it's somewhere in like. I think it's somewhere around the two to six billion parameter range. It starts dipping below like ten percent. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I'll have to confirm that with you. <clears throat> Yeah. Technical question. <laughs> how were you able to make this photo? How how do you calculate how many flops per layer? Yeah. Uh, so this involves um, knowing. So so you can basically like um, infer the total number of flops that was used to train the model, uh, given the sequence length, the batch size used, and um, the total number of GPUs used. Um, and yeah, then you can infer it based also by, by the size of the size of the model as well. So there's also some profiling involved in this. No, no, this is just casual. just floating point operations. Okay. Yeah, so it's a deterministic uh, output. Yeah, I mean, if you make an assumption about the length of the thing, then you know, you can calculate the sub etc. Exactly. <clears throat> and all this information is like uh, available in the OPT paper. <clears throat> Um, so turning to our research questions, uh, we've been really interested in, in not just using conditional compute to scale model size, but also building modular models, right? So the key insight here we leverage is that um, you can actually use language variation as your way to route data to experts instead of doing things at a token level. Um, and so our first uh, kind of attempt at, at doing this was through a method we call DMIX layers. Um, where the whole idea here is instead of routing different tokens to experts, uh, we're going to route sequences to experts, where the sequences are organized by some notion of domain provenance. Um, for example, you know, is it a medical paper or is it a Reddit uh, common thread? And we use conditional compute to train these domain experts in parallel. Um, I'll show in a few slides how this sort of materializes in hardware land. Um, the key thing to note here and was really encouraging to us is that this did yield modular models because the basic idea is that because of domain specialization, you basically only need to use the experts that are relevant to your domain or task at test time. And so you can kind of uh, add or remove experts as you want. And in particular, we also found that like ensembling the outputs of different experts for domains that you didn't really know what the domain uh, or, or you, you didn't know whose provenance was was really um, was really helpful. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we did this ensemble technique um, uh, with respect to branch to merge. Um, so thinking about where we go from DMIX, uh, it's really for people to think about how these models are trained in hardware land. So uh, if you consider this basic diagram of a GPU cluster, uh, where it consists of multiple cluster nodes and multiple GPUs per cluster, uh, and generally when we train language models, we want to use as many GPUs as we can in parallel because we can use our batch size, we can see much more data in the same amount of time. Um, in dense training, we copy each model parameter on every GPU, and then we train by shuffling all of our data, supplying mini batches to each GPU, and then we compute an average gradient across all the mini batches and update all the model parameters with respect to this average gradient. Okay, so the key thing here is that um, is that all of your copied weights are synchronized. So in the end, you have a single set of parameters that's been exposed to all the data that you've seen on all your GPUs. Okay. So in DMIX training, so we're going to specialize those feed forward layers, right, to domains. The, the way that we do that is that we assign each GPU a domain. And then we, uh, for the feed forward layers, we only compute gradients um, with respect to data from each domain. Okay. So this actually means we're training many more parameters uh, than the dense model but actually with lower latency training because we're not synchronizing all parameters of the network, right, uh, together and everything's running parallel. Um, but note, there are still shared parameters in this model, right? We still have the self-potential layers, we still have those embedding layers. Um, 
that are synchronized across all the GPUs. So we still need a ton of GPUs active synchronously <coughs> to make this model work. So a key question we have is, you know, can we remove expert synchronization entirely, right? So we can disentangle these experts um, and train them independently. And so to train them, we, um, we propose this new way of doing um, sort of expert training, which we call embarrassingly parallel training. And um, in this setting, we make all parameters domain specific, and not just the feed forward layers. And this means you can train these experts asynchronously. None of them are dependent on each other. And if one node goes down, then other nodes can stay online, and you only need to restart a subset of the parameters. Are the embeddings also separate? Everything's separate. Okay, so it's not parallel, it's just four models. You'll see. <laughs> um, so embarrassingly parallel training uh, results in a collection of expert language models, right? So which we uh, call an Elm Forest. Uh, there's lots of tree imagery. Um, each of which is a complete language model, okay? So there's no shared parameters between experts. Um, and there's much more improved modularity over TMIX because there are stronger guarantees on the domain exposure per expert because the data is fully contained within that language model. However, I'll talk about in a bit, uh, how the strength of these guarantees or depends on your curriculum of training elms, okay, and the data that's, uh, that you expose each elm to. Okay, so before I talk about training these models, I just wanna talk about inference. Um, so assume you have K, you know, uh, elms around, you know, how do you use them at inference time? Well, the naive way to use elm for us is to just use a single expert that you've trained for the data. So just, if you have medical data, just use the medical expert, okay. Um, this assumes that the test domain is singular and revealed, uh, which isn't optimal, right? Um, actually, we found that this naive inference technique is, is very rigid. It leads to poor performance, especially in out of domain settings. We don't really know what the domain is um, that we're evaluating. Um, yeah. Is your inference simply just probability of the sentence? Uh, yeah, we're just doing perplexity evaluations. Yep. <clears throat> For now, yeah. Um, well, we find that. Uh, Relaxing this assumption at inference time um, leads to large improvements in performance. Basically, we increase the variance of our model substantially by ensembling the outputs of experts on the target domain and figuring out what the domain of the test data is while we're ensembling. Um, so to mix experts, we take some evaluation data. Uh, for example, this is like COVID-19 paper expert. We feed it to all the experts, and then we estimate what we call a domain posterior on the current uh, context. And basically, this is just a probability distribution over the experts, where higher probability for, the, uh, for an expert means that the expert has more affinity to this target text. And then we ensemble the outputs of experts using this probability distribution as weights. Okay. Um, so this is basically a parameter-free mixture of experts model, where the routing is performed <laughs> at uh, inference time instead of learned during training. Okay, as then this is, it's usually learned during training, as I mentioned before, in a previous mixture of experts models. Um, so uh, a little more formally, you know, we decompose the probability of the next token, um, given the context with a mixture of experts. So we introduce this new variable D, which indicates the domain of the context. And we want to estimate the prob this posterior probability um, of the domain given the context. And this is our domain posterior. And um, to estimate these ensemble weights, we just simply use Bayes' rule, okay? Um, so that means we're going to be tracking the running likelihoods of experts on the context, okay? Um, and then we're going to weight this by some prior that we have on the domain, um, and then we're going to normalize, okay? So uh, tracking the running likelihoods of experts means you have to do forward passes on all the experts, right, to do this inference, but we're going to address this limitation in the next part. Um, so this prior is basically the most important part of this equation, right? So how do you set this prior? We tried a lot of, we did a lot of research on how to set this prior properly. Um, we first tried uniform prior over all the domains and we found this does really poorly because it's gonna update domains that are, are irrelevant to this context. We tried an updating prior, which is a little more Bayesian, right? So we update priors based on the domain posterior where you compute for previous sequences in this test data set. And this does much better than uniform. But actually the best way we found is like, assume you have some held out data in your domain and then estimate a prior on that, fix it for your test set, okay? Um, this has a limitation of needing extra data, but it's reasonable to assume that for most domains you're gonna have that. But again, in the next part, we're gonna address this limitation. So how is it different than having four separate models and doing an ensemble? Yeah, at the end? that's a great segue. 
I think that's the next slide. Oh, actually, two slides. I'll, I'll address that. Okay. <laughs> um, so before I address that, I just want to also mention that uh, we also introduced a new way to combine experts uh, at inference time, where we collapse the parameters of the model using a weighted average, uh, where the weights are also identified by this base rule inference procedure. Um, Let's talk a little bit more about how these inference mechanisms compare in a bit. But a key thing to realize here is that averaging allows you to have the same inference cost as a single expert. Okay. Um, all right. So let's address the elephant in the room, right? So you might be thinking, what you're doing here is really simple. Just train K language models from scratch. Uh, that's embarrassing in parallel, right? Um, well, the surprising thing is that this actually doesn't work uh, because we don't only just want k different language models. We want to be able to combine them in interesting ways at inference time. And what we find is that this naive way of training language models or expert language models doesn't let you combine them after training. Um, and so uh, we introduced this new algorithm called branch train merge, which allows you to kind of um, ensemble and uh, on get much better ensemble. <coughs> and actually allow you to collapse experts into an average um, after training. <clears throat> okay. um, so branch tree merge uh, involves four steps. So uh, first step is to train what we call a seed language model. And this is basically a language model trained on some shared corpus. And this is the root of, our, of all of our domain experts. And it basically provides an initialization of the Elm forest um, where you don't have any existing elms. Um, so C training is kind of the, the critical thing here um, that makes the um, averaging work and gets you much better ensemble performance. Um, it has, it, it basically, again, it provides an initial, initialization, a shared initialization for all the experts. It has a lot of connections to do with um, theory around like learning trajectories of models training from shared initializations, the stability of lost surfaces, the lottery ticket hypothesis, a lot of really cool ideas. Um, we have a lot of work in the paper in investigating the seed uh, seed training and like how much compute you need to apply to seed training, and not, I don't have a ton of time to dig into that here, but um, yeah, basically you can uh, you can get away with like uh, I think it's like five or ten percent of your total compute applied to seed training, and you get uh, much better ensemble performance, and uh, you can actually start averaging uh, and emerging experts. Okay. Um, what we find is that heterogeneous data makes for the best seed corpus, um, but you have to be really careful about your seed if you want modularity guarantees after training, because um, if you want to be able to remove an expert and be sure that uh, the data that the Elm Force knows nothing about that, that domain, you have to be really careful about what you initialize the, the Elm Force with. Okay? Um, so again, we have a lot of stuff in the paper around that. Um, the second step is to branch new experts from the seed language model um, or existing experts from the Elm course, if there are any. Um, the way we branch experts is by taking a weighted average of existing experts um, in the forest, where um, the weights are identified by some measure of similarity between the experts domain and the new domain you'd like to train on. And then we do standard training of the language model with cross entry loss. Uh, the key thing here is that if you have multiple domains you like to train on, then you can train them embarrassingly parallel. And finally, we merge the trained experts back into the larger collection, which we call the Elm Forest. Sorry, you're, by merging, you mean like taking the average of their parameters? Uh, actually, uh, this merging operation is just adding them to a larger collection. <clears throat> and the cross entropy lo loss is per model? Yes. So you start with one model, mm -hmm. then you train into four models. Yep. And then you put those four models back in, back and in. then you do it again. Then you can do it again. Yeah. So it's an iterative process, right? So you can start with uh, you start with like a seed seed model. You branch into k domains in parallel. Then you add them to your forest, and then you can just keep repeating this procedure for new domains. The merge is just concatenation. The merge is just concatenation. So now you have four models, and then you get sixteen. Uh, yeah. So like, so let's say you have four models, then. Uh, eight new domains come in. No, 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 no. I'm saying, yeah. let's just say you only have four domains. Okay. So you start with one model. Yep. It becomes four models. Yep. Then can we do another cycle or are you done? You're done there. If you only have four domains. Yeah. So let's say you have 16 domains. You can do things in batches, right? So you can train on four, four at a time. Yeah. Um, so in this setting, and we'll talk a little bit about the setting where you have a fixed data set. Um, and you kind of create or induce domains from a fixed 
uh, data set size, but in this setting, just assume that you have uh, k data sets that you'd like to um, uh, to, to branch out to. So, uh, how do you ensure that the right data set goes to the right model? Uh, how do you ensure that the right is? Yeah. So, um, the way that we initialize new experts uh, in um, in the setting is by taking a weighted average of existing experts in your forest, where the weights are identified by domain similarity. Any questions? How do you measure domain similarity? Uh, it's again through this domain posterior evaluation that I mentioned before. Yeah. Are you going to get to how you identify the domains? Yeah, actually, yes. And this is not student teacher, right? Student teacher, they combine. Yeah, it's not it's not student teacher um, because the original the, the the teacher is not updated basically, and that allows you to have uh, continual learning essentially. <clears throat> So how do we evaluate BCM? Uh, there's a lot of results in the paper. I'm going to provide some noteworthy ones. Um, so before we get into results, I think it's important to actually to understand how we how to compare dense conditional compute models. Um, the whole point of conditional compute is they have a much larger model, right? That have the same inference flops as the dense model. So, um, or sorry, training flops as the dense model. So we can't really compare models based on how many parameters were trained. So instead, we have to do multiple axes of comparison, right? We have to compare against compute match settings, so uh, comparing the same number of GPU hours or uh, training flops. Um, we look at training speed, or like the number of um, seconds it takes per update, which um, measures like uh, the effects of removing synchronization. And then um, we, compore, we, we compare uh, these models um, against parameter counts at inference time, right? Because you can basically uh, modify the number of inference parameters in a, in a conditional compute model by just using different numbers of experts, right? Um, so this is kind of a measure of how slow a model is to interact with. All right, so evaluation setup. Um, for our first set of experiments, we're going to use this multi-domain corpus that we uh, curated for the DMIX layers project, so we can direct, directly compare to that method. Um, then we have a second set of experiments where we expand the number of domains that we're looking at. Um, uh, just to see how it works with the larger corpus. And we're just going to be looking at complexity for these uh, for this talk. Um, and uh, we're going to look at models at multiple scales. Um, but again, everything is compute match, so it's, so it's kosher. And this is the data set that we do in our first round of experiments. So here we just have one round of learning, just eight domains, and we're trying to branch into eight domains to see what happens. Um, we have like uh, sort of eight, uh, eight training domains that we curated. Uh, that are pretty diverse, and then we have a set of novel domains that we just uh, evaluate on. Uh, we don't really know exactly what um, how these these test domains align with the novel, uh, the training domains, so it allows us to analyze the effect of like ensembling. Are you only using the eval tokens then? Uh, yes, we're only using the eval tokens. Yep. <laughs> this is crop domain adaptation in short, right? In a way. Uh, yeah. Uh, well. Uh, and what do you mean? Yeah, I mean, it's basically, you're training them on one domain and hoping that it works on the domain sure. that not seen. Sure. Yes. Heavily inspired by them. <laughs> um, so, first set of results show that under compute match settings, BTM consistently outperforms both DMIX and dense models across all parameter scales. This is really cool because it suggests that embarrassingly parallel training is not only more efficient, it provides large performance improvements due to specialization of the experts. And here we're using output ensembling as our inference technique. Um, we also find that expert averaging or other inference technique outperforms um, dense models uh, at no additional inference costs. Um, uh, but BTM ensembling does still does better than averaging, which kind of makes sense since there's much more capacity and inference time for, for ensembling since all the experts are active. Um, and looking at training speed, um, we uh, see that removing synchronization yields bigger and bigger benefits as the model size grows. At our highest compute budget settings, uh, here is actually we're, we're normalizing the um, average updates per second against the dense model. That's why it's all one here. Um, the BTM model is 33% faster to train than the equivalent dense model um, because we're removing synchronization. Um, we then uh, kind of uh, tried to do multi-round multi learning on 64 domains. Um, and so we've created a much larger corpus. And then we kind of do this batching procedure where we 
uh, do seed training on a, on a subset of these uh, domains, and then we uh, iterate through the BTM algorithm, training on batches of these domains. Um, and uh, amazingly, we see that the Elm Forest ensemble trained with 64 domains gets almost the same perplexity as a large dense model that's trained with almost three times the, the total compute. Um, so this suggests that BTM is a really effective way to scale into massive data sufficiently, and we're going to explore this idea more in detail in the next part. Um, and if you analyze the domain posteriors on the evaluation data, we find that the probabilities assigned to experts are pretty sparse. So only a few experts are active at inference time, um, which makes sense due to domain specialization. Uh, basically, we find that you can use that if you apply a top K to the, to the domain posterior, um, during ensemble, you can basically get away with like four or eight experts without uh, a substantial loss in performance, um, but at a small fraction of the total parameter count at inference time. And even the Elm Force average does substantially better than the dense model uh, at no additional inference cost. So that's, that's really cool. So these results are going to inspire the techniques of our next part. Uh, we're going to explore sparsity as a function of the total number of experts trained for a fixed computational budget. Okay. Um, so to close, you know, BTM uh, enables stronger, modular, more efficient language models than dense models. Um, and uh, the way we model domains is like a tree with the roots starting as, as a seed corpus, allows you to trace the ancestry of different domain experts with different guarantees on their modularity based on the path, uh, the data that this path in this tree was exposed to. I think that embarrassing parallel train could, could chart a path towards decentralized development of, of language models where different users and institutions can asynchronously contribute elms to a larger forest that's, that's shared by the community. Cool. Um, so with that, uh, are there any questions? We'll move on to the next part. <clears throat> yeah. Are, I have one you have to um, find specific hyperparameters per domain when you're training your models, or is everything completely your phone? Um, that's a really good question. So uh, the main, one, one of the main differences is that each domain varies dramatically in size. Um, and also in the entropy of the text is another kind of critical feature that, that is different. In this work, we didn't do much hyperparameter tuning to, um, to account for those features just because it was very expensive to do those. But I think you would probably want to do that. Um, well, wait, so my question was though, did you use the same settings for every? Yes, we did. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, for example, from a smaller model, or from the smaller domains, you do multiple epochs of training to uh, match the compute that you would apply to other domains. So, so so you like by uniform compute, right? You just want to get whatever the consequence, but you don't do anything in terms of like learning rate. Yeah, yeah. we just keep everything right. nice. Yeah, that's right. All right, cool. Um, so I have one question. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you're doing uh, averaging of the different experts, right? And you're saying that you're not. Thing like as good performance compared to the ensembling. Mm -hmm. um, I get the intuition that you can actually average the weight because you have this model. You couldn't do it otherwise. Yeah. Did you try like just trying methods like I don't know, permuting your activations and aligning them before averaging? Like methods like Git Ray Basin, because yeah. when you're thinking from different domain experts, you've actually shifted the loss landscapes very far away. Totally. From yeah. yeah, I think it's a, it's a really good point. I, I I don't think we explored the possibilities of merging as much as we could have. Um, and there's lots of really cool techniques that have been coming out around model merging. Yeah. Um, one idea also, like, um, you know, in addition to what you just mentioned, is like maybe you want to average different parameters differently, right? Like right now we're kind of splashing uh, everything in sort of a a, with a linear function. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, there's lots of really interesting techniques to, to, to do more sophisticated merging. Um, and I think that's a really interesting area for future work. And just to maybe last you know, uh, is, sorry, during the averaging, are you considering the same probabilities okay. you are for ensembling? Or are you just uh, doing yeah. like proper squash? Sorry, what? Uh, so uh, <clears throat> when you're ensembling, you're considering weights, right? It's like which you're which you're predicting using the base. Are you using those probabilities to also average your weight? Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. Yes, I am. Yeah, and yeah, it's, it was surprising to us that actually worked. <laughs> but I, I think yeah. it's really this notion that uh, 
yeah, um, that domain similarity is kind of what you should mostly be waiting for, I guess, um, when you're combining these experts. But even in this uh, in this setting, like we find that the top, like just using the top two experts in the ensemble seems to outperform just using the average. So I think there's lots of room to improve how we merge um, to get even better performance. Yeah, definitely yeah. makes sense. Thank you. All right, cool. So um, let's move on to part two. Um, so to kick off the second part, I just wanted to kind of address the term that I glossed over in the first part, this question of what a domain is. Um, it's one of the most important aspects of this modular framework is to figure out how to cut up your data, right, to specialize your experts. So what is a domain? Well, in the previous part, we previously we implicitly defined a domain as some notion of provenance, right? So what is where is this document coming from? Is it a Reddit document? Is it a biomedical paper? It's a coarse and lossy proxy for like a social process that induced the data, right? Um, for example, it's intuitive, right? You know, uh, assigning all Reddit comments to this uh, same subreddit makes sense since some humans have decided that these this rest subreddit sort of exists and comments in that thread told platform. So it's easy to retrieve and it's interpretable, um, but there's lots of limitations of using metadata to define domains, okay? Um, first off, metadata is not always available, okay? So if you look at web crawl data, people usually use terabytes of this text and don't really, really keep track of metadata. Um, sometimes the URL is the only thing you have access to and it's difficult to infer other features of the document, like its authors, authorship or whatever. So this limits the applicability of BTM there. Um, and secondly, it's really difficult to understand how BTM scales with metadata defined domains, right? Like how many authors do I need? How many subreddits? Um, it can't be easily controlled for. So trying to merge and subdivide domains is a really tricky process. So in this part of the talk, we're gonna do something different. We're going to rid ourselves of the requirement of metadata altogether and assume that domains emerge from distributional representations of a pre-trained model, which uh, can be identified with um, unsupervised clustering. Right, so um, clustering comes with an assumption. It, applies, it implies that domains are lexically driven, which may not be generally optimal since distributional representations can identify some social intent, but not all. Um, and also the domains are less interpretable than what you would get with metadata, depending on what pre-trained model you use to embed the, the text. Um, but this, no, this uh, notion of domain is gonna allow us to apply BCM to arbitrary data sets that we can cluster it can also give us a control over the number of domains we have for a fixed data set size. <coughs> carefully study the scaling properties of BCM um, for a fixed computational budget. And uh, as I'll show you later, uh, we use the cluster for routing data. So there's no need for forward passes uh, to experts for inference. There's no priors involved. Um, and so it makes things much simpler. So we've tackled a ton of modeling problems by just switching how we identify domains to data. So it kind of indicates how important this, this question is. Um, so this brings me to cluster BTM, um, which is a, a very simple way to train a modular model with sparse inference in a very parallel fashion. So um, first uh, we cluster the training corpus. Um, you basically can use any embedder from this step, use TF-IDF for scalability and simplicity and interpretability. Um, for clustering, we use a balanced k-means clustering um, I don't have much time to get into it, but balancing is really important to do um, to make sure you don't get degenerate clusters, which is common with k-means without additional hacks. Um, basically, we formulate the k-means problem as a balanced linear assignment problem, and we enforce that we always assign equal data to cluster centers when we run uh, k-means. Um, second, we branch experts from a seed model, just like we did before, except this time we're going to use an off-the-shelf language model, OPT that's been trained on a bunch of data because we know that heterogeneous data makes for the best seed. Um, and then we do a variously parallel training um, on the discovered clusters, okay? Um, and finally, we merge the trained experts back into the larger forest for, for free features. And um, for this uh, set of um, experiments, we're just gonna do a single round of CBTM, but I'm gonna talk about how um, we could do multi-round CBTM in the future work. <clears throat> Um, so let's look how we do inference with CBTM. Um, first, I'll give some visual intuition before describing the inference process a little more formally. So to do inference, uh, here we first embed the incoming test context with our pre-trained embedder, and then we get distances between the embedding and all of our cluster centers um, with our pre-trained cluster, okay? 
And then we're going to convert these distances into a probability distribution over experts. And we're going to take the top K of this probability distribution based on how much compute we have at inference time. And then we can perform an output ensemble of the experts in the same way that we did for BTM, using this probability distribution as weights. Okay. Um, so a little more formally, again, we have this uh, decomposition of the probability of the next token um, into a mixture of experts. And we're trying to compute this probability of D given the, of the domain given the context. Um, and here, instead of doing Bayes rule, uh, we're basically just going to compute Euclidean distance between the bedding of the context and uh, each cluster center. Then uh, we're going to apply some temperature parameter that allows us to sharpen or smooth that, um, that those distances. We're going to negate it, softmax, and then um, we're going to do a top K specification. So this technique is improving over our Bayesian wave ensembling by avoiding the need to do any forward passes on the experts, since all we need is the cluster that we've pre-trained. Um, there's no additional data needed for inference, right? Um, uh, because we just use a cluster for everything. And there's no assumption that we need evaluation, that uh, the evaluation data comes from the same domain, right? Since we have a unique ensemble for every context. Yeah, mixture is happening in the context, right? Correct. So this yeah. makes this more like topic modeling than... Uh, yeah, that's true. That's true, yeah. I mean, uh, especially since we're using like a TF-IDF sort of embedder. <laughs> uh, okay, I mean, TF-IDF could be the, you know, document type also. But sure. Like, okay, interesting. <clears throat> Cool. So uh, let's evaluate CBTM. Um, in the first part, I'm going to, uh, just like the first part, I'm going to provide some bird's eye view of the results. You can check out the paper for more information. Um, you know, first, a natural question is asks is to ask is, you know, does it hurt to use metadata when we're specializing experts? Uh, the basic answer is no. Um, we train CBTM on eight random data sets from the pile and compared it to training BTM on the same data. We found that you can basically get pretty similar language modeling performance. Again, this is perplexity. Um, in fact, CBTM might do a little bit better, uh, and this might be due to the fact that it finds a different segmentation of the data from the provenance uh, metadata. You can see here in this heat map, which basically aligns the clusters with the metadata across the eight data sets that we train and evaluate on. Some data sets like uh, stories and like uh, math tend to be aligned with a single cluster, whereas other data sets like common crawl and open web text align with multiple clusters, which sort of makes sense because they're more heterogeneous probably. Um, <laughs> And so generally, as well suggest that metadata might not provide the most optimal segmentation. Um, but given that these CBTM results seem to do pretty well, we were kind of interested to see how CBTM scales. So we can study um, how um, the, so we, which we can study now because we have control of the number of experts, right, for a fixed data set. So in the paper, we train and evaluate on two big corpora, corpora first the C4 data set. Uh, which is a huge data set of, of, of web crawl documents, and then the Semantic Scholar Research Corpus, which is a collection of uh, academic papers. Um, and for each data set, we train on up to 168 billion tokens of text with up to 128 clusters and train on up to 1,024 GPUs. Just to carefully um, understand the scaling behavior of BTM, controlling for computational budget and the number of experts for a fixed data set size. So as with previous works, we're going to consider language modeling performance or complexity on how that data um, we also have few shot uh, text classification results in the paper, but uh, I don't really have time to talk about those today. Um, our key research questions are, uh, you know, what is the effect of increasing the number of experts for a fixed data set size? Is there an optimal number of experts for a data set size? And what is the effect of sparsifying experts, especially as you increase the number of experts for a fixed computational budget? Okay, so we're trying to, going to try to carefully disentangle these factors. Um, Here's a visualization of one of our core results. Um, basically, each line in this plot compares the performance of training different numbers of clusters to the same amount of data. Okay, so uh, we start with 100 or uh, 1.3 billion tokens, and then we go all the way down to 168 billion tokens at this bottom curve. Okay, so all points in the same line are compute match settings. Okay, so they're all they're, they can be compared. Um, but uh, we train from one to 128 clusters, but know that the one cluster model is the dense model, right? So our method is uh, generalizing between dense and specialized models. And the first thing to notice is that if you start from the leftmost point, right, um, which is training one cluster model, 
you can always see that we always always get better performance as uh, we increase the number of clusters that we're training on. Okay, and this effect seems to grow as we increase the total amount of data. Um, but uh, there is an optimal cluster count, right? So in um, the lowest budget setting, two clusters is optimal, then four clusters becomes optimal, then eight is clusters is optimal for a wide range, 16 clusters becomes optimal then. That's pretty cool because it suggests that making that to make better use of more data, you want to train more experts. And training these experts in in parallel is much more efficient to train on more data, right? You gotta do 16.5.2 just to complete the graph, right? Yeah. <laughs> Only we had more. Uh, yeah. Um, but what we find is that uh, there is such a thing as training too many experts for a given budget, right? Because you're basically just cutting the data up too much, and the experts aren't seeing too much data, enough data. However, the cool thing is that even at the largest budget settings, our model is trained with even 128 clusters is still better than the dense model, right? And training with 128 clusters on 168 billion token text is way easier to do than with one cluster because I don't need you only need eight GPUs active at a time to train this model, whereas you need 1,024 GPUs active for this model. Wait, why do you need multiple GPUs active at a time for any of these? So yeah, because um, uh, well, we want to train on large batch with large batch sizes. Okay, so just just you're saying. Eight GPUs is what you need for any one of the small models. Correct. Okay. Oh, so you mentioned that there is such a thing as too much, too many clusters. Yeah. Because it ends up like breaking the data too much, mm -hmm. and then, like the experts might not be seeing enough data. Yeah. Do you think it might also be due to the fact that? Uh, experts might not be able to take advantage of. Um, like relevance between domains, in a sense that uh, things that with 16 clusters would, would have clustered in the same uh, group yeah. and could benefit each other are now like sort of forced to belong to two different clusters. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, that could totally be a factor here. And I feel like our ensembling method is relatively simple. And you could probably think of better ways of ensembling to make use of those uh, different, um, yeah, like increased specialization. Um, but yeah, this is a super interesting feature. Yeah. All right, so now we turn uh, to results around sparse inference. Um, we found that using top K experts works remarkably well, meaning you can only, you only need to retrieve um, you know, the top four or two experts and basically you have the same performance as having uh, all experts active at a fraction of the uh, inference parameter counts. And even the top one model does much better than the top uh, than the one cluster dense model. So this suggests that you know, if all you care about is like inference costs at test time, you, what you really want to do is train a large model embarrassingly parallel and then sparsify rather than train a small model from scratch. Um, instead of top K, did you also explore trying like just top P, like probability wise? I don't know what the distributions are among the experts yeah. where top K usually is good enough because you always have, you know, pretty good top two totally. or if, like some domains or some input of text is like, a bit more heterogeneous, as you mentioned. Yeah. So uh, yeah, as as I showed earlier, um, and we have this in the paper, but the probability distribution that's over experts is like very very sparse, and, and so um, I'm not sure if top P would provide anything more, okay. substantially different there. Um, it's a grid that you showed earlier. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Wait. The the. Topness itself, that's the prior, which is context dependent, right? Uh, when you yes. say the top, right? So, so that means that in practice, you do have to, um, you have to be, but like, so you're not, you can't just like say, well, I'm gonna, you know, I have eight experts, I'm actually only gonna use one eighth of the parameters, uh, because I know what the number one expert is, like when I deploy, right? So, you still have to investigate all eight experts like the whole time you totally yeah so like um in practice this could like if you only have let's say you only have like enough um ram to accommodate one expert but you have like eight or 
12 experts around, you could, in theory, like swap experts in from the CPU into your GPU, right? Um, it would increase your latency a lot, but um, there's actually a lot of work that's been uh, thinking about that sort of efficient inference where you're kind of swapping in parameters from the CPU into the GPU. Um, but that's like super exciting work, yeah. In this setting, we just assume we have like, we have enough GPUs to host all of the models, but we're only gonna use uh, a subset of them at a given time. <clears throat> Um, next, we look at how fast these models are to train, measured in terms of the maximum number of seconds per update. Basically, it's pretty simple here. You know, we show that you know as the compute and data grows, you basically want to be training more clusters for faster training, right? So this is the one cluster model, the two cluster model, then four clusters, eight clusters. Um, basically, you know, we get faster training as we increase the total compute because um, you know we have less synchronization between experts as we increase the number of clusters, right? Because so we're dividing the compute up more. Um, in the paper, we also compare to a classic token level MOE model, and I don't have time to dig into it, but like these models are really expensive to train because there's lots of communication happening between the experts since they're specialized to a token level, right? Um, um, and finally, uh, the result I want to show you is this really cool result showing showcasing that training a really large CBTM model and then sparsifying it um, can outperform a large dense model, okay, with similar parameters. Counts. So we showed this by training a 16 cluster model, okay? Um, and that's using only the top four experts at inference time, meaning its effective inference parameter count is 5.2 billion parameters, okay? And then we, comp and then we compare this to a six point, to training a 6.7 billion parameter um, dense model, okay? And so in this plot, on the x-axis, we have the total zeta flaps used to train these models and then y-axis is perplexity. And um, first thing I notice is that uh, the zero shot performance uh, in terms of its efficiency is, is this big gap here. And that's because remember, we're starting with the seed model that's uh, been trained for vastly different amounts of compute. Okay? So the 6.7 billion parameter model was pre-trained for two to three times the amount of compute um, as the 1.3 billion parameter model that we initialized our CBTM model with. Um, the cool thing is that uh, if we align these curves based on how much token, how many tokens is necessary to train on to get to a particular perplexity value, we can see that training this CBTM model on 168 billion tokens of text, we can match the perplexity of a 6.7 billion parameter dense model with less than 30% of the total training flops. Okay. So this suggests that like you can basically train a CBTM model which consists of many small models for much longer because you can see a lot more data because everything's embarrassingly parallel. Um, uh, and uh, you can get a similar performance as a larger model uh, trained with much more compute. Okay. Um, so I think this happens, this, this is because like we can see, like with CBTM, you can see a lot more data for the same amount of time uh, and the same amount of flops um, than you can with uh, with a dense model, a larger dense model. <clears throat> How many epochs has, have you gone through in these cases? It's all one, one epoch. Oh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so this, um, this, this is gonna, this is, this is very inspiring for us for a lot of future work to see whether many small expert models can outperform a bigger dense model. On but, so, so another way though of looking at that is to say that if you only expose yourself to four billion tokens, then yeah. the the you get your model is much higher complexity. Totally, but uh, the flops necessary to do it to right, do exactly. that is much higher. Yeah. So there's like a trade off between basically how many like the data requirements and compute requirements. Exactly. Correct. <clears throat> So, sorry if uh, this question uh, sort of uh, comes from me and not knowing the literature, yeah, enough, no but uh, have you done the studies like, unfortunately, like, because we are so used to dense models, a lot of studies are used, are done using dense models. And to show similar effects, like, for example, have you studied scaling laws on these? Yeah. Just to... It's a really important question. And we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. um, 
about, for example, like emergent behaviors or exactly, something exactly. with with these sorts of things. Um, I think a key question is so one thing I didn't mention here is uh, the few shot results that we have in the paper. They basically seem to track really well with these perplexity results, um, where we can basically like either get the same performance or actually substantially outperform the um, the six point seven billion parameter model on domain specific downstream tasks. And so a key question for me is like, are these emergent behaviors due to size or is it due to data, right? Um, it's yeah. possible that like, you know, if you see the right data and special it properly, you can actually get really amazing performance on certain tasks, right? Um, so, I, but it's an empirical question to figure out. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, downstream task results kind of correlate with these perplexity things. And so far we've seen that, but remains to be seen. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so just to wrap up here, um, we've shown that CBTM generalizes BTM to arbitrary data sets using unsupervised clustering. Um, you know, you see we want to scale data and experts together to get the best bang for the buck on, out of CBTM. And uh, we show that few shot task results close, uh, or sorry, I should say that in the paper, we show that few shot task results are going to are tracking very closely, but we have a lot of work to do there. Um, so yeah, just a couple points of closing. Um, you know, I think our explorations into building modular models suggest that you know, being more careful about our data, conditioning on language variation, moving away from treating data homogeneously is not just desirable from a responsibility perspective. You know, it also leads to more reliable behavior, it leads to substantially more efficient scaling, at least very cheap customization options after training, um, and you get better language modeling performance. So everyone wins. <laughs> um, and so, you know, looking forward, I think a lot of these techniques we talked about can contribute to this possible feature of decentralized models. Um, you know, we've got embarrassingly parallel training for asynchronous development, modularity and sparsity for shaping data coverage. I didn't talk a lot about this uh, collaborative computation idea, but I think it's a lot of really interesting future work there. Um, and uh, speaking of future work, there's lots of really interesting directions that I'm excited about. Hierarchical CBTM, this idea of doing like multiple iterations of CBTM on a fixed data set using hierarchical clustering is really cool. More downstream task research, emergent behaviors, uh, training an opt out language model is something I'm really excited about. So, if you're really careful about the data that you expose your seed model to, then you can be really uh, sure that experts, if you remove an expert, um, that your the rest of the model doesn't know anything about that particular domain. Um, so I think that's a lot of uh, really cool ideas there. And um, that's all I got. Thanks so much for listening. And... All right, thank you so much for the great talks, Jin. Um, I mean, I know we're over time, but um, is there anyone who wants to ask another quick question? Yeah. So two questions, all right? Yeah. Uh, so First of all, thank you. Interesting talk there. Yeah. For the clustering, what is like your elementary unit? Is it just a sentence or is it like a whole document, like a newspaper article? Or, or yeah, it's always a document for us. Um, yeah. But the inference uh, happens at a context level. Um, so there's kind of an interesting question of like, can you cut up the data in a, such a way that it's more aligned with what you do at inference time? Um, that's an interesting area of future work. And then the second question was, I mean, have you kind of investigated the cluster set yet? So, if, you know, we've seen on the slide, you had some prominent uh, lexical items that kind of suggested that they're good clusters. Yeah. Have you looked a little bit into what it does? Would that align to what a human would intuitively do? Yeah, uh, totally. Because you might have articles about Ukraine, but in the news, you might have it on Reddit. And, you know, there's different ways to kind of carve 100%. Things. Yeah. So, uh, it's a really good question. In the paper, we have uh, lots of analysis of the clusters. Mm -hmm. um, because we're using TF IDF as our like embedding, it's very lexically driven. So a lot of it is topic related, um, and uh, I think like there's a lot of really cool work to make more sophisticated embedding algorithms that maybe incorporate metadata around authorship, things we care about in terms of allocating domains. Um, so somewhere in between, like uh, kind of presented two very extreme versions of how you might identify domains, one with just metadata, other with clustering. There's a really interesting sure, yeah. sort of um, future work to combine them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, okay. Sorry. All right. 
Uh, since we're over time, we'll wrap up. But definitely, um, if you can, um, um, you can reach out to Chen later on in the summer time if you don't have a one on one with him later today. So, um, once again, um, let's thank Chen for the great talk. Yeah.